You know, you often send us sources that really challenge what we think we know. But today, today we are taking on a claim that is so ambitious, it, uh, it tries to rewrite centuries of foundational geometry. We're going all the way back to Plato's solids. All the way back. And if you've ever held a perfectly formed object, like a crystal or maybe a dodecahedron from a game, you've probably wondered why these specific shapes? Why are they so stable? Right. How do we even classify them? And historically, the approach has always been, well, observational. We find a shape, we count its vertices, its edges, its faces. And then you check the math. You make sure it all adds up and satisfies some core rule. Exactly. We classify the geometry after the fact. But this new mathematical framework we're diving into today, the Grant Projection Theorem, it completely inverts that whole process. It says you don't find the shapes, you, you generate them. And the starting point for this entire universe of three-dimensional complexity, this is a simple two-dimensional right triangle. That's the deterministic engine, right. a Pythagorean triple. And our mission today is really to unpack the source material and understand the three sort of deterministic stages of this projection. So how the sides of that flat little triangle can predict the entire 3D structure. The whole thing. The number of corners, the type of faces it has to have, and, you know, the total complexity of its edges. And here's the absolute kicker, the biggest claim we have to tackle in this deep dive. Euler's formula, that bedrock of topology, right? The idea that vertices minus edges plus faces must equal two. That VE plus F equal two. Yeah. That's not some external rule you have to check at the end. Yeah. The generation process described by this triangle automatically forces the final shape to be topologically valid. It's an intrinsic property. It's yeah. baked in from the start. If the numbers in the triangle work, the resulting structure has to live on the surface of a sphere. It almost suggests that these polyhedras, they aren't just possibilities in some continuous geometric space. They're discrete. Yeah. They're uh, quantized. Quantized. So you only get a valid shape when the generating key, the triangle, clicks into place perfectly. It's a huge conceptual leap. I mean, it implies that Euclid and Plato weren't really defining the fundamental rules of geometry. They were just classifying the results of this deeper generative process. That's the claim. Okay, so let's get into this generative process. Let's start with the engine itself. The sources call it a Grant polytope. Right, which is, I mean, it's essentially just a right triangle. But a special one where its side lengths, let's call them A, B, and C, can act as the key to generate a 3D structure, a harmonic solid. And this is where we have to translate some of the jargon, because these sides aren't just random lengths. They represent these uh, fundamental proportional relationships. They do. So the shortest leg, A, is what's called the differential mean. The middle leg, B, is the geometric mean. And the hypotenuse, C, is the arithmetic mean. The arithmetic mean, see, that's like the simple average we all know. Yeah. And the geometric mean, B, is more about the mean of proportions, yes, right? Yes, exactly. So those three numbers, A, B, and C, they somehow encode the entire structure. The research then shows how you extract these core factors from the triangle. They define a difference factor, F1. Which is the hypotenuse minus the short leg, so CA. And then a sum factor, F2, which is the hypotenuse plus the short leg, C plus A. Okay, so a difference and a sum. And what's really fascinating here is the connection between these two. Algebraically, if you multiply them, the difference factor times the sum factor, you always get the square of the middle leg, B. Wait, hold on. So F1 times F2 equals B squared. Always. So the difference and the sum of the outer two sides perfectly define the middle one. It means the whole triangle is perfectly encoded in just those two factors. It's a completely lossless key. You can recover the entire topology of the system just by knowing how far apart those legs are and how long they are combined. And the sources say this goes even deeper, that this triangle actually generates nine fundamental means. That's right, nine of them, including things like the harmonic mean, the quadratic mean, and they all serve a very precise structural purpose. Which is why? They define the shell radii, basically the exact distances from the center where the vertices of the final polyhedron have to land. They form this, this self-similar cascade. Meaning the structure folds out or in using the same ratio over and over? Precisely. A ratio of R equals CB. So the entire geometry is, in a way, pre-programmed. It's just sitting there in the proportions of that simple right triangle, ready to cascade out. All right, let's move to the core mechanism then. Stage one. Yeah. How do you get the size of the shape? The vertex count, V. Right. If this system is truly deterministic, the triangle has to tell us exactly how many corners the final shape will have. And the formula they give is V equals A plus 2 times B plus C. Okay, so A plus 2, B plus C. And that doubling of the middle leg, B, that geometric mean, 
that seems to be the critical insight here. Why, why not just add them up, A plus B plus C? And this is where the source material gets, I think, really compelling. The reason sounds a lot more like physics than pure geometry. How so? It views the final solid as an equilibrium system, a harmonic cascade that's centered on B. So you have this outward centrifugal expansion, which is anchored by C, the maximum reach. Okay, pushing outward. And you have an inward centripetal contraction pulling inward, anchored by A, the minimum radius. So B is like the balancing point, the spine of the structure. It has to be. Yeah. It has to serve a dual role. It acts as the limit for the outward push defining the shape's boundary, but it also has to act as the anchor for the inward pull, stopping the whole thing from collapsing. So to maintain that perfect, stable equilibrium, it has to do both jobs. And that's why it's counted twice. That's the explanation. That yeah. dual role is why it's doubled in the vertex formula. Which would mean that every stable polyhedron, even a simple cube, is inherently an equilibrium system. Just a snapshot of perfect balance. Precisely. So once we have V, the number of vertices, stage two is figuring out the face type. What are the walls of this solid made of? Are they squares, triangles, pentagons? And this is where it gets incredibly elegant because the answer is encoded directly in the... Uh, the numerical structure of the triangle itself, just whether the sides are integers or not. This is the face type theorem. The rule is just so simple. The face type, which we'll call a k-gon, is determined by k equals 6 minus the number of sides among a, b, and c that are whole numbers, integers. Okay, let's take the classic example. The Pythagorean triple, everyone knows the 3, 4, 5 triangle. 3, 4, 5. All three sides are integers. So three integers. That means k equals 6, 3, which is 3. It has to have triangular faces. It must have triangular faces. Wow. Okay, what if only two sides are integers? Say one side is a square root or something irrational. Then k equals 6, 2, which is 4. That forces the shape to have quadrilateral faces, squares. And if we use a more complex generator, maybe one involving the golden ratio where only one side is an integer. Then k equals 6, 1, which gives you 5. Hmm. Pentagonal faces. The whole external architecture is just determined by the, I don't know, the numerical resonance of the generating key. It's almost musical. It is. <laughs> and once you know V, the size, and K, the face type, mm -hmm. the rest just falls into place. The face count F and the edge count E, they just follow from standard polyhedral relations that mathematicians have used for centuries. It just confirms that the entire topology was there in that 2D triangle before anyone ever drew the 3D shape. So let's talk about a concrete consequence of this. Let's focus on what the sources call the consecutive leg family. Right. This is a special infinite sequence of Pythagorean triples. And the rule is that the middle leg B and the hypotenuse C are consecutive integers. They're separated by exactly one. Like four and five or 12 and 13. Exactly. And because of how they're constructed, these triples always have three integer sides. So A, B, and C are always whole numbers. Which means, according to the face type theorem we just discussed. They have to generate solids with triangular faces, every single one of them. They are the perfect family to test this claim of quantized geometry. And the vertex counts for this family are perfectly quantized. They don't just show up randomly. They form this discrete sequence. Let's, uh, let's run through the first few. Okay, so the first member, the smallest one, is that familiar 3, 4, 5 generator. Right. We plug those values into our formula. V equals 3 plus 2, 4 plus 5. That's 3 plus 8 plus 5, mm -hmm. which is 16. So the 3, 4, 5 triangle generates a shape with exactly 16 vertices. Not 15, not 17. 16. The next one in the sequence, ND2, is the 5, 12, 13 triple. Okay, so for that one... V okay, so moving from the uh, the certainty of these 3D spheres, mm -hmm. the Grant Projection Theorem also claims it can generate 4D structures, specifically one of the most complex regular shapes, the 120 cell. And it does this using a triangle based on the golden ratio of 5. This is where things get really wild. They do. This is the most complex geometry presented, and it all comes from what's known as the Kepler triangle. It's a specific right triangle with sides of 1, the square root of phi, and phi. And what does this golden triangle generate in just three dimensions? In 3D, it generates the regular dodecahedron, the solid with 12 pentagonal faces and 20 vertices. Okay, so that's the starting point. But traditionally, when mathematicians talk about the 120 cell, they imagine taking that 3D dodecahedron and sort of extruding it along a fourth axis, yeah. a, a perpendicular direction we can't even see. That's the standard approach, but the theorem says no. It says the 120 cell is generated by an inward self-similar projection. So not by adding a new dimension out there, 
but by the dodecahedron recursively folding inward on itself. Yes, yeah, like it's breathing inward. It creates these successive shells, and the radii of those shells are defined by powers of the golden ratio. It's like a fractal or a hall of mirrors folding into itself. So the fourth dimension isn't an external axis. It emerges as the, the depth of recursion, how far into itself the shape is folded. That's exactly it. And this inward cascade is mathematically shown to generate exactly 120 nested dodecahedral cells and 600 tetrahedral cells, which perfectly matches the known structure of the 120 cell. It's not an approximation. And there's a profound verification for this, isn't there? There is. This internal self-similar process yields the established ratio between the 4D volume of the 120 cell and the 3D volume of the dodecahedron. And that ratio is pi squared over 2. About 4.935. It confirms the mechanism. And the conclusion in the source is just. It's beautiful. It says the 120 cell is the memory of the dodecahedron looking inside itself. That complexity in higher dimensions is found through depth and self-similarity, not just external extension. That idea of dual directions outward versus inward brings us to the last big unifying concept, that the generating triangle supports two necessary expressions of its stability. We call them phase conjugates. That's right. The same triangle creates two paths. The first is the convex path, which is what we've mostly been talking about. The outward distribution that maximizes the vertex count and creates those smooth spherical polyhedra we know. And this path satisfies all the standard rules for stable geometry. It does. But then there's the second path, the stellated path. This is the inward concentration. It flips the factors and maximizes edge density instead. It creates these high density self-intersecting structures the spiky stellar polyhedra. Ones that seem to violate the normal rules of stability. Exactly. And neither path is more fundamental than the other. They are twin expressions of the same harmonic source. One distributes content outward into a stable surface. The other concentrates it inward into a dense complex core. This inherent stability, this is what leads to the final and most theoretical piece of the puzzle. The one that connects the geometry to physics, the zero action Lagrangian. And we really have to provide some context here. In physics, the principle of least action is, well, it's everything. It means physical systems are always evolving, always changing. They're falling toward a state of minimum energy, minimum action. The universe is constantly trying to find a stable resting point. Right. But in this geometric framework, they define a Lagrangian density based on these geometric factors. And when you calculate the total action for the entire system, it is identically zero. At all points. It's not seeking zero. It's already there. It's already there. This is the key insight. These geometric structures, the ones encoded by Grant polytopes, they exist in a state of perfect intrinsic equilibrium. They aren't evolving toward minimum action. They're already at zero action. It takes no energy to maintain their topology. The shape exists simply because the numbers that define it are in perfect balance. So what does that mean for us? If the fundamental building blocks of geometry, these shapes that underlie crystals, molecules, maybe even more complex systems, if they're all inherently in a state of zero action of perfect equilibrium, what does that geometric stability suggest about the foundational stability of physical laws themselves? That's the final question, isn't it? You have to wonder if every shape we see isn't just some fleeting physical arrangement but a permanent, perfectly balanced expression of these cosmic numbers held in a state of zero action. It really makes you think that maybe, just maybe, the universe is designed to simply be not to constantly fall towards something else.